There's an important battle being waged in Washington right now over something called, quote, spectrum, a battle that's extraordinarily important to the future of the Internet and one in which the extremists are now prevailing. This is a battle over whether we will sell all spectrum such that access to spectrum is controlled by those who own the property right. If the extremists win, then this will destroy the potential for cheap, ubiquitous, uncontrolled access to the Internet that's increasingly spreading throughout the country right now. We need to do something to stop this shift before the shift becomes permanent. For some background. Spectrum refers to the range of radio frequencies that are usable in communications technologies. Analogous to sound frequencies, symphonies tune at A440, radios tune at much higher frequencies. So, for example, 880 kilohertz refers to the radio frequency of a certain AM radio station. Now, since the 1920s, spectrum has been regulated in the United States, regulated with a spirit more of this man and this philosophy than what we ordinarily think of as American policy. For the government exercised command and control over who was allowed to use what spectrum when. Now, the entity that did that regulation was the FCC, and it allocated spectrum, as this map demonstrates, in extraordinarily careful and extensive ways, setting off particular uses at particular frequencies. Now, the particular frequencies that are important right now are those in this range of the spectrum band, governing both television at from the 2 to the channel 51 range, and also what we think of as uh, UHF frequencies. The standard way in which the FCC regulated these frequencies was to issue licenses. Licenses that basically said, you may radiate X frequency in Y place for a period of Z time. This was a government regulation of a scarce resource. Regulation justified by the United States Supreme Court in the following way, quote, owing to its physical characteristics, Radio, unlike other methods of conveying information, must be regulated and rationed by the government. Otherwise, there would be chaos and radio's usefulness would be largely destroyed. This is the spirit of communism, which in the 1950s began to make many quite skeptical, at least some like economist Ronald Coase, who wrote a very important paper asking, why is spectrum any different from any other resource such as paper? And the typical way we allocate scarce resources is through a property right. The government allocates the property right and then lets the market decide who gets what rights or what property. And in this system, there's no need for the command and control of communism. We could regulate this resource spectrum, Coase said, in the way that America regulates most resources through a property system, free of heavy-handed command and control. Now, I want to be very clear, in my view, for the technology of the time, Ronald Coase was exactly right. And because the FCC didn't follow Ronald Coase at the time, billions in resources were lost. This government regulation, as perhaps always in the case of government regulation, was eventually corrupted to benefit the existing incumbents against new innovation. So whereas Coase was ridiculed, it's the FCC's policies that were ridiculous. Coase went on to win a Nobel Prize. The FCC went on to recognize its mistake in not following him 30 years earlier. Now, there's an important subtlety in Ronald Coase's argument, one often missed by those most vigorously supporting Ronald Coase. This is something I called Coase's first question. Ronald Coase didn't say always you should use a property right to allocate resources. Instead, Ronald Coase asked a first question, is property necessary at all for a general allocation of a particular resource? As Ronald Coase wrote, all property rights interfere with the ability of people to use resources. What has to be ensured is that the gain from interference more than offsets the harm it produces. So, for example, think about the air, a resource necessary for many different functions in our life. Should a property system govern access to air? Well, for certain purposes, such as power plants that emit carbon, you might say, sure, a property system would be a good way to assure that 
too much carbon wasn't emitted into the atmosphere. But for the ordinary use of most humans, we would say the answer has got to be no. It would be ridiculous to imagine a property system allocating your right to breathe. Or, for example, with sound or the silence, which itself is a resource. Should we think of a property system to regulate the use of sound or the interference with silence? Again, the answer is no. Laissez-faire here is enough. We don't need government here to regulate access to this resource because people are able to regulate access to this resource well enough on their own. And that's the same question we should ask about spectrum. Is a property system needed here too? Well, in the 1950s, given the technology of the time, I think Coase again was clearly right. The benefits of a property system plainly outweighed any costs. But the question we need to ask is not about the 1950s, but about today. Now, whereas all in this debate agree that the communist command and control processes of the early part of the FCC's history ought to be eliminated, the fundamental question is whether we even need a property right in this current technological environment. Or more precisely, whether the costs of a property right, a system to regulate property here, would outweigh any benefit. Well, in the 1980s and 1990s, the property ideologues, people who I will, to be fair, refer to as, quote, extremists, said the answer to that question was yes, we needed property here because there was nothing new in the equation. Just as Coast argued before, we should implement now. But if we are to follow Ronald Coase, we need to follow Coase in his first question, too, by asking whether property now is really necessary. Is there a way to get the government out of the way of the use in deploying spectrum using devices by relying on the market? Not a market in spectrum, but a market in devices that better utilize the spectrum, that find the best use of the spectrum without any overlay of government rights. In the 1990s, those who believed that there was such an alternative started a movement, a movement we could name the movement to, quote, deregulate spectrum. They argued that this regulation was not necessary because now, because now machines were smart enough to negotiate the noise created by other machines, just as people at a party negotiate the noise around the party. These machines could figure it out, and property here would only slow the innovation and create unnecessary barriers to new innovation. Now, at first, this alternative movement to deregulate spectrum was just a theory. But it gained real traction the more devices like this began to spread around the world. For the deployment of Wi-Fi technology was a proof of concept that this unlicensed spectrum model could really work. Minimal rules governing the devices, not the allocation of spectrum, and smart devices that then compete to negotiate the use of this spectrum without any property system and without the negotiation of lawyers. These are devices working out how best to use the system, how to connect to other devices, and the point that Wi-Fi makes absolutely clear is that such a system can work. Indeed, it works astonishingly well, better than anybody would have predicted even just a decade ago. Now, the point about this is that we create competition not over spectrum resources, but competition among devices. And that's the competition that solves the problem of spectrum without government regulating access to spectrum. This is an unregulated access to spectrum. Spectrum, in this sense, is held in a commons. And that unregulated access has produced connectivity and explosive connectivity supported by a wide range of companies and technologists building huge growth in access made possible, not in theory, but in practice, not just for Wi-Fi, but increasingly for other protocols as well. Now, around 2001, there was a kind of consensus then about how we should develop spectrum policy. I describe that consensus in my book, The Future of Ideas. And the answer, as I described it there, was that we should not adopt a single policy of either shifting all spectrum to property or all spectrum to the commons. Instead, we should do both. 
we should take wide swaths of spectrum and allocate it to property and allocate it to the commons to see which works best. So we eliminate the command and control system of the early part of the last century, and we replace it with this mix of property and commons and see which system produces more value, where value here does not mean profits for a particular company, but value means economic growth for the economy and society in general. Now, there were many who agreed with this particular proposal. Uh, Jerry Fallhaber and Dave Farber. Fallhaber, who was the ch former chief economist at the FCC, and Dave Farber, sometimes referred to as the grandfather of the internet. In an important paper they wrote, Spectrum Management, Property Rights, Markets, and the Commons, they also concluded that a mixed strategy was appropriate. They wrote, quote, we note the similarity of our proposal to that of Lessig, which all proposes, also proposes a mixed system of property and of commons. And the FCC in 2002 all also adopted this model that the FCC should support the development of alternative systems for regulating spectrum, the commons, and a property system to see which works better. All of these people supported this mix so that one of these two systems might eventually prove itself over the other. But since 2001, things have not gone quite as it seemed they would. First, we've had lots of progress, progress in the technology supporting these unlicensed uh, spectrum rules, amazingly new devices and protocols and plans to use these devices on the unlicensed spectrum band to efficiently and cheaply grant access to the internet. Municipal wireless technologies have begun to deploy themselves in ways that give very cheap access to the internet. All of this supported by the most innovative technology companies, all aiming to deliver cheap and fast connectivity to everyone. But as well as progress, we've seen some regress, and regress not in technology, but in policy. For the idea that the commons would hold a central place in this new spectrum policy has begun to retreat. We've not seen more property and more commons, at the, as the FCC suggested in 2002. We've seen actually more property and less commons. The total spectrum allocated below the 3 gigahertz level. The property has about 753 megahertz, and the commons has just about 130 megahertz. And since 2002, the property area has gone up by 519 megahertz, by while the commons has gone down by 10 megahertz. The extremists are succeeding in this debate, pushing the FCC and others so that everything is owned. And the biggest win here has been in the swath of spectrum around the 700 megahertz. This is the spectrum that was originally used to support UHF television. It's essentially unused, a total waste of beachfront spectrum policy, because the spectrum radiating in these frequency ranges actually is much more effective at penetrating buildings and other objects to be used as spectrum for multiple types of devices. Now, originally, organizations such as the New America Foundation and others were pushing to make at least some of this spectrum unlicensed, to give this deregulated spectrum market more of a chance to grow. But Congress, pushed by some of the most important interest groups here, forced the FCC to sell it all, of course, except for that part that the government needs. No spectrum here would be unlicensed. All of it be, would be auctioned. Now, why did the government shift its policy like this? Well, there's a simple picture to explain it all. Money. There was money here for the government. That's what they would get from the auctions, even though the amount of money they would get was a fraction of the total value that would be produced if some of this spectrum, at least, were set off into a commons. But second, there was money for the re-election of important members of Congress because this system of allocating spectrum according to property benefited some very important industries. These industries were pushing to develop this alternative of owned spectrum to limit the extent of unowned spectrum that might compete with it. So in this way, the philosophy of the internet has been rejected. Rather than open and competitive platforms on which people prove themselves by developing better products, a kind of cell phone philosophy has captured Washington. 
closed proprietary technologies that make it much harder for outsiders to succeed in defeating the incumbents. So now what's the issue before the Congress just now? Well, the 700 megahertz battle over unlicensed spectrum within that important beachfront range has been lost. But there's a second best that's being pushed by many right now, and it's that second best which we should be pushing as well. This is the proposal to take advantage of white space in spectrum allocation. White space refers to the unused space in a spectrum, uh, created originally as a kind of buffer between different channels, indeed television channels from 2 to 51. The proposal, first put forth by the Numerica Foundation and a coalition of uh, technology companies and now embodied in a proposed statute, the Wireless Innovation Act of 2007, sponsored by Senator Kerry and Gordon Smith. The proposal is that unlicensed devices would have the right to use this spectrum when it's being unused by licensed users. They would develop low-power, smart technologies, cognitive radios that would essentially listen before they talk and talk without interfering with the licensed users. Microsoft has even developed a prototype of this technology, a kind of demonstration how it would work. This is a picture of the very ugly device they developed, but in technology circles, the uglier the device, the more authentic the demonstration. This technology, if allowed to prosper, would facilitate unlicensed use of this white space and an explosion in technologies to once again utilize the white space in an efficient way. But the extremists here reject this use of white space technology. They do so for two very different reasons. First, they say it will create interference. And second, they say it's inconsistent with the idea of property where the property owner gets to control what happens on the property, and only what the property owner allows should be allowed on that property. Let's consider each of these arguments in turn. First, the argument about interference. This is deja vu all over again, same as it ever was, because we've seen this debate all before. It happened originally in the late 1990s, early 2000s, over low-power FM radio. Based on new technology, there was an opportunity to have many more FM radio stations around the existing radio stations that would not interfere with the existing radio stations' transmissions. The FCC originally pushed this alternative because its objective was to increase the number of speakers. But Congress intervened to reject the FCC's idea, and it rejected it claiming that the FCC's proposal would create, quote, interference. But Congress didn't mean interference in the sense of technical interference. Congress meant interference in the sense of competition with some of the most important political contributors that Congress knows. It took the leadership of people like John McCain to fight this outrageous limitation in the increase in the number of FM stations. And we achieved a kind of limited victory. Money corrupted the talk of what technology could do here. It produced less competition than we otherwise would have had. But we've gotten some because that resistance has been fought by those who insist on some truth in the discussion of what technology can do. Well, that's exactly the same thing that's happening here. Money is again corrupting the process of setting spectrum policies. Technologies that are being evaluated for technical purposes are being regulated because of the consequence to the bottom line of some of the most important actors in the technology space, namely the incumbents. So this is a technology that could offer no interference with existing uses. It could increase competition among uses of this spectrum, but it's the competition that the incumbents want to eliminate. And so they use their power to create FUD around what this technology would do to stop the FCC and Congress from pushing forward in liberating this spectrum to an efficient, unlicensed use. Second, this resistance of the extremists hangs on a particular argument around property. And we in our tradition, when we hear the word property, we get a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling about the home is the castle and the need to protect private property thoroughly. 
Well, there's something important we need to keep in mind about this spectrum property. For did these people who would insist upon this absolute control over spectrum create the spectrum? No, they did not. Did they build it? They did not. Will they allow uses of the spectrum that would compete with them? No, they would not. The obvious point here is that there is no such thing as spectrum. The, quote, property right that's being created here is wholly artificial, designed simply to grant exclusive rights to use certain devices. Now, I'm for exclusive rights, at least where we can show they are necessary to create uses or speech that otherwise wouldn't exist. But technologists are increasingly showing us how perfect control here is actually not necessary to create the incentives or the opportunity to use spectrum. And you don't have to be an economist or a technologist to recognize this. You know this, too. This is what your Wi-Fi technology in your computer does every hour of the day. It uses spectrum without any allocation of property rights, even though there are five or 10 or 15 other devices within range that are all trying to use the spectrum at the same time. The technology has demonstrated it's possible, and to the extent it's possible, we should be encouraging this use to eliminate regulation where regulation is not necessary. What we know here, though, is this doesn't matter. This technical argument right now doesn't matter. What's mattering in this debate is money, and that's what's creating the problem. So what can we do to get people to recognize why this is a problem? Well, first we have to be clear about what kind of problem this is. So think about an analogy that might help. There's a very large hot dog market in the United States, something like $1.5 billion spent on hot dogs, including sales from Walmart. You might ask the question, why doesn't the federal government nationalize the hot dog market, nationalize it, and then sell to people the right to sell hot dogs? This doesn't have to be a kind of communist control over the hot dog market. Instead, we could create a property right, the right to sell hot dogs sell that property right, and then people would buy and sell that property right to raise lots of money for the federal government. And the rights in the market would be allocated to the most valuable user. Now, is this a good idea? You don't have to be an economist or a technologist or a rocket scientist to know that it would not be a good idea. It's not a good idea because first, it's totally unnecessary. We have a very healthy market in hot dogs without there being a second market in the right to sell hot dogs. And second, it's potentially anti-competitive. I mean, think about innovators like this person who creates the pretzel hot dog. Would they be able to create the pretzel hot dog if someone else has the exclusive right to sell ordinary hot dogs? The point here is exactly the point Ronald Coase raised in his first question. Is property needed? And in the hot dog market, hot dogs do just fine without a property right. There's no need to create the property right because we get all the trade in hot dog we need without there being some special government-backed property system to allocate the right to sell hot dogs. Now, the key to this debate is to recognize it's exactly the same argument here about spectrum. They want to create rights in the right to use spectrum, just like one might create rights in the right to sell hot dogs. They want to sell those rights to the highest bidder, just like one might sell the rights to sell hot dogs to the highest bidder. But if it's unnecessary to create these rights, like it's unnecessary to create the rights to sell hot dogs, and if it could be anti-competitive to sell these rights, just like it might be anti-competitive to sell the right to sell hot dogs, then we should do something to stop them from this change in the access to uh, spectrum, a change that would limit the opportunity for this much more open, competitive, vibrant spectrum mark. Uh, market to develop, a market not in spectrum rights, but a market in devices that use spectrum. Well, what can we do? The first thing we can do is to support the white space legislation that has been introduced by Senator John Kerry. The Wireless Innovation Act of 2007 would guarantee that this white space could be used for unlicensed devices. But the second thing, more fundamentally, is that we should be supporting spectrum deregulation generally. 
in any context, we should be regulating by the federal government only where it's necessary to regulate. And when technology changes, especially in the context of radio technology, we're seeing that the need for regulation is less. And to the extent it's less, it is necessary we adjust the amount of regulation to leave to the free market in devices, the development of technologies to use spectrum rather than the government-created market of spectrum to allocate who has the right to use spectrum according to who buys a property right. The third thing, though, is that we need to recognize the common pattern here. Think about the debates around media concentration, network neutrality, and spectrum regulation. In all three contexts, essentially the same battle is at stake. There's an effort to kill competition, the competition that the internet originally produced, an effort being funded and driven by incumbents. Incumbents who don't like this competition, for whom competition is just an annoyance, and these incumbents would use government power to eliminate that competition. Now, they will win this battle because in our political system, unfortunately, money talks and controls unless we do something to resist it. There's lots to do. You can get information about how to support changes in spectrum policy at these sites, but I urge you to do something to make this change now before we embed a system of property rights that will make it impossible for the most efficient use of spectrum to be allowed. Thank you.